Um, I think a lot of you know of Alex, uh, there are some of you in person, but certainly by reputation. I'll give you a little bit about his background. So uh, Alex is a physician and he's also um, got a PhD, so he's one of these double doctor types. He is the founder of the Center for the Global eHealth Innovation. He holds a Canada Research Chair. He's a professor in the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation um, at the Dallana School of Public Health, and he is also based at UHN. And for us, I think I'm really proud to say that he's a member of our research advisory board, so we get the benefit of all of his expertise and his amazing ideas here at Women's College. And he's also a member of the Design Thinking Group at University of Toronto, which is just an amazing group with lots of interesting uh, ideas and, and products coming out of it. So he's very unique, I think, in that he's a physician, but he's also an educator, a researcher, and an advocate, which is quite something. And his mission is really, I think, to help to improve health for people all around the world. And I know he's going to be talking about that today, uh, but it's also possible that he could have given a talk about love and how to be happy and all sorts of other things that I think are really pertinent to what we do here um, at Women's College and pertinent to everything that, that we're involved with. It's interesting that some people have described him as being the human internet or a human internet or that sort of a, a thing because he's the sort of person that does work that brings people together, that makes connections. And even in just the few minutes before we started rounds today, he was already um, making that happen. So he brings together people with knowledge, with tools, and the goal is to make life better for all of us and to improve health. So um, he's been working not only with academics, uh, but with communities and, and literally with countries around the world so that we can all improve what we do. So with that, delighted to have Alex with us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's have a good time together. Um, and uh, I'm really trying to figure out how to get away with happiness. So if you ask me the non-official version is that, could we create the conditions for every human being to have the longest, happiest, healthiest possible life full of love with no regrets until the last breath. And we tend not to talk about this word. So now that Paula mentioned love, yes, I'm very interested in love. I'm very interested in happiness. And we don't give those terms the value that they deserve. So in our personal lives, we want, we want health, we want happiness, we want love. In our professional lives, we talk about other things. Those are things not to be discussed because we carry the risk of being perceived as soft. So today, I'm going to talk about one of them, which is health. So let's talk about health and whether we have the conditions to create the pandemic of health. And if you look at the etymology of pandemic, it has nothing to do with disease. It has to do with something that affects us all. So, let's begin. These two super women are my mother and my grandmother. They are my only two living ancestors. For those of you with mobile phones, please put them on vibrate on a place where you would enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is a very important component of e-health. I hold the Canada Research Chair in e-health. Uh, and perhaps we should talk about sex more, given the response I got here, okay? <laughs> and, and, uh, which is another very neglected topic within the so-called healthcare system, which is not about health, it's not caring, and it's not a system. We know it, but we don't talk about that either. So, these two superheroes are my mother and my grandmother. And um, my grandmother is almost 100 years of age. And uh, she looks after my mother, which is one of the most interesting shifts that we are experiencing. Now there are old parents looking after old children. So in this case, somehow life played the trick on them. My mother is demented, and my grandma looks after her. And my brother, who is a big professor in Colombia, and I went home and said to Grandma, Grandma, we are here to relieve your burden. 
um, we want to take mom away. And you should have seen this, this lady. Over my dead body, she said, <laughs> like this. She looked at us, at us in a very scary way. She said, she is my child. You are not going to take her away from me. If you take her away, you will kill me. I will look after her until my last breath. So basically, back off. And here we are, two health professionals, in theory prominent, recognized, in theory successful, getting this reaction from this old lady who is basically telling us we are fine. And we were baffled because this didn't match our training. You could not be fine when you are demented and looked after by a 90-year-old, 98-year-old <laughs> lady who has arthritis, who can barely walk now, and who is insisting that they are fine. How could they be fine? I said, Mom, how are you? I'm fine. <coughs> and my grandma says, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> I told you so. Back off. So my brother and I really left puzzled. So what happened in there? What happened in there? Yeah. Or what happened to us in the places where we trained? Yeah. That doesn't allow us to understand what's happening here. So I met with my board of directors, and um, because I, I have another confession to make. Uh, my name is Alex, and I am my worst enemy. Nobody can hurt me more than me. Nobody can fool me more than me. Nobody can trick me more than me, and I cannot help myself. Vibration on a place you would enjoy, please. Okay? Not switch them off. You can text. You can do anything you want. I am okay with that. But the sound may bother other people. Okay. And um, so I have a meeting with my board of directors in 2007. And my wife, Martha, uh, we started dating in 1981. We met on the 21st of January of 1980, and the poor woman cannot get rid of me. <laughs> um, so as you can see, they're holding me there, trying to protect me from me. Okay. And they give me instructions. I meet with them monthly, and they give me recommendations on how to live the best possible life. And my kids have been doing it since they were 8 and 10, because I was nagging them too much, and I didn't know I was nagging them too much. So I said, guide me. I want to be the best possible daddy, but you didn't bring a manual, so you need to help me. And they are pretty tough. And in addition to them, two people who are called my assistants help me, and a couple of friends who are almost 90. And they, they assess me whenever they want. Whenever they feel like it, they give me a hard time with a lot of love. So I have a meeting with my personal board of directors. This is the core team. And they give me clear instructions. Okay, we're worried about you. You're not looking after yourself. You must stay healthy. I said, easy, easy. I will exercise more. I will watch what I eat. I will try to sleep more. Don't deal. Until I find myself in the hospital with a possible diagnosis of colon cancer. I had blood in my poop. Alex, how could I have blood in my poop if I'm so wonderful? Yeah? <laughs> if I'm a doctor, I cannot be ill. All right? This is for somebody else. We speak in third person. The patients, the family members, those with this diagnosis, my study subject. We don't use first person. So I want to invite you today to switch to the first person. I was in hospital. I experienced how it is, and it's nasty. It's not nice. We have designed these places okay, to increase people's suffering. The places are badly designed. They don't look beautiful in most places. Okay? I'm very impressed with how things look at women's college. <laughs> Uh, but I was there, and I could spend an entire week describing the stories, including how to get an extra gown so you don't have either your <laughs> pee, pee exposed or your ass, okay? <laughs> which is the two options that you have. 
and how I heard very intimate stories of patients on my sitting by me. I was waiting there and somebody was interviewing the patients and say, tell me, when was the last time this or that? I was sitting there. And then there were willing patients from a colonoscopy showing me how I was going to look after the thing. And nobody really cared. And we talk about informed consent and privacy and all that. And most of the time, I don't know if you're going to bleep this, Michael. It's bullshit. Beep, probably when, when it appears <laughs> on, the, on the recording. Yeah? Because we really don't mean it. When we talk about privacy and when we talk about consent and when we talk, it's to protect ourselves. That's what I felt that day. I said, what are we doing? How many of you have had a colonoscopy? Okay, how many of you have not had a colonoscopy? Okay, how many of you are not sure? There are about 30%, <laughs> about 30 of you, for those of you or you who will be watching this at a different time or place, we are getting there, 70%, better than the lectures. Okay? So I was there, and I didn't have... I didn't have cancer, and I saw the whole thing. I had a patient that day and didn't speak English, and her husband was dying, and I promised to be available. And then I had this thing booked. I couldn't change the time. Anyway, I managed to grab my phone, which was taken away from me at some point by the nursing staff, because you should not have phones in hospital. And I said, why not? And the nurse, who is very nice, said, because that's a hospital policy. I said, why? Because that's a policy. And, and why? I don't know. I said, why? And she said, give it to me. And what the hell? Okay? And I said, I have a patient who doesn't speak English, and I promised them to be available. They should call the switchboard. I said, hey, didn't I just say that they don't speak English? And this woman, who is wonderful, came back to me and said, later on, after all these things passed, she said, you cannot imagine how crazy it is here. I really care about people. But most of the time, I cannot care. Okay? Because I have to get the work done. That was the kind of experience I had. Anyway, this is a bit of catharsis, so thank you for uh, 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 being so receptive. But the thing that hit me most at that point was this. I said, what if I had had cancer? Would I be condemned to be ill for the rest of my days and labeled as somebody who is not healthy? Is it possible for me to have cancer and yet be healthy? And then another thing hit me. 20 years of university wasted. <laughs> if I want to be healthy, I need to know what the word health means. What is health? Do I know what I mean when I say health? I'm a health professional. I work in the health system. I do health research. I influence health policy. I review health research grants. Do I know what health is? Think about it. You know what health means. When was the last time you talked about the meaning of health? Isn't it fascinating? So what is health? Hmm? Said 20 years. The last time I heard it was when I was an undergrad student and somebody gave me the definition from the WHO. So that was the year 2008. We were celebrating 60 years of the World Health Organization, and I cannot help it. I don't have time to go through the story behind the story, but I can tell you that my verb is to question. And what makes me happiest in life is not to know. So when I, know, don't, I don't know something, and especially when I don't know something, and I realize that I didn't know it, I feel terrific. So I asked questions. And uh, at one of the celebrations of the 60th birthday of the World Health Organization, I couldn't resist. I raised my hand. Yeah? And what you're seeing here is my inner child, which is pretty alive. Okay? This thing and this beard and all that, that, this is the skin bag that at some time forces me to behave like what is considered to be a grown-up, which is very sad, by the way. So, but the inner child here is saying, how can I talk to him? And, uh, and I was like this at that meeting, you understand? And they, somebody just spotted me and said, yes. I said, Alex Haddad from Canada. Okay? Yes. I said, do we know what we mean by health? 600 people celebrating the 60th anniversary of the World Health Organization. Silence in the room. Shit. 
okay? <laughs> the realization, I did something wrong, but I don't know what was the beep, Michael. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and you see, we make taboos of these normal things. Shit, we all have it. Probably we spent some of it this morning before coming here. We're going to do it later on today. If not, we worry. And yet, we make them, oh, he said, he said shit at the hospital, in the auditorium. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. What's happening to us? You understand? This is the degree of, of, of problem that we are dealing with. We, we don't talk about normal, important things. And shit is a normal, important thing. <laughs> Correct? Should I call it differently? Thesis. <laughs> Excrement. Okay? Yeah, it will make you feel better. It will be the same thing anyway. Okay? It will not have the same effect. Um, uh, anyway, at, at that meeting, another wonderful woman today, I'm paying a homage to women. My mother, my grandmother, Martha, our daughters. Laura O'Grady, who was working with me as a postdoctoral fellow, Fiona Gotti, editor of the British Medical Journal. She said, you troublemaker, okay? asking those questions. What can we do together? I said, hey, let's use a journal to see if we can get a global conversation about the meaning of it. And they were so gracious that they said, go for it. Yeah? So we use Facebook too and wikis, and I was accused of being a vandal at Wikipedia because I was trying to use Wikipedia, which comes first on the, on the web. If you put health definition, Wikipedia trumps the World Health Organization. <laughs> so I put there, the definition hasn't changed in 60 years. We are trying to promote a global conversation on this. Please join it. And the editors of Wikipedia came back and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm using the network effect. You are ranked higher than the World, the World Health Organization, and we are trying to figure out what this means. And, and you are a social network. This, we are not a social network. Stop vandalizing Wikipedia. <laughs> if you do this again, we are going to ban you. And I have this, I have this capture. I have the screen uh, captures of that. Yeah? We are not a social network. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. Anyway, uh, somebody at the meeting said, we define health when we founded the World Health Organization, like, like this. <laughs> I had already read the constitution of the World Health Organization by that time, but I kept straight face. I said, yes, please. And that person throws it. All men, by the way, look, all men, gray. <laughs> No women there, creating probably one there, <laughs> taking a note somewhere, okay? But all men, very important. Okay? And uh, this is how we as the world define health. To give birth to this organization which was going to show us how nice we could be with each other after we killed each other more than ever before during the Second World War, which was meant not to happen because the First World War was the war to end all wars, okay? so much, okay, for our predictive powers. But, as he said, health, and he recited, is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just the absence of disease or infirmity. Take that, basically. <laughs> well, kept my straight face. I said, okay, anybody here, please show me your hands if you have complete physical, <laughs> mental, and social well-being. Show me your hand. 600 people in the room. Yeah. Now, let's simulate that. Anybody here, show me your hand if you have complete physical, <laughs> mental, and social well-being. Hands up. Okay, that's fine. You seem very healthy to me. And I need... <laughs> and I need oh, so you are... Okay, okay. But if you are, please let me know because I'm looking at people who feel that they have complete physical, social, and and mental well-being, just like I'm looking for people who don't have mobile phones. They are so rare these days that they deserve to be studied. Yeah? So I'm very interested in understanding why some people don't have mobile phones, just as I'm on this, trying to, to figure out if somebody can fit the WHO definition, which hasn't changed since 1948. Okay? So I said, what have we done? What have we done? Same. Cannot be healthy. And this is not a gay flag with a nice design. Yeah? This is data from Scotland, which pretty much mirrors or reflects what's happening around the world. As we age, we start accumulating chronic conditions. 
Now, the most frequently found chronic condition is multi-morbidity. Multiple chronic conditions are the most frequent chronic condition. 5% of people consuming 50% of the resources. And we don't know what to do with them because we continue to have departments that are aligned with organs, with systems, or diseases. Okay. And I have four chronic conditions. What do you do with me? Oh, it depends on which one flares up. <laughs> they will pay attention to that one, basically. I feel like crap. Okay, we don't know if it is the disease or the diseases or the interactions between the disease and the medication or, or interactions amongst medication. We just published a paper in JAMA showing that more than 97% of clinical trials exclude people with multiple chronic conditions. So our clinical trials are fairy tales built around individual diseases which are becoming increasingly rare. So we don't even have an evidence base to deal with multiple chronic conditions. We don't know how to classify them. We don't know how to talk about them. We don't know how to approach them. And yet, they are becoming reality. So the longer we live, the more we are going to accumulate these things. So are we condemned to be not healthy? Because if we look at the other side of the definition of health by the WHO is the absence of disease. Okay, so but if, if you have disease, you cannot be healthy. And if you don't have complete physical, mental, and social well and, and social well-being, then you're screwed too. So we are screwed one way or the other. Bottom line. And, sadly, we all benefit from this. Because the more medicalized society is, the more people need us. So we are part of the problem. And I was certainly trained to look at disease. And the first question when a patient comes is, what seems to be the problem? Correct? What seems to be the problem? So we are focusing on the problem and reinforcing the problem. So another woman shows up, Magdal Huber. This is a colleague from the Netherlands. And I get a message saying, hmm, interesting conversation, Dr. Haddad. By that time, I was panicking. I felt so smart to begin with. WHO, I'm taking you. <laughs> I'm so smart. <laughs> okay? When I was looking at the so-called conversation, there was no conversation. People were writing saying, I think health is this. And somebody else would write, no, health is this. No conversation. There were 23 new proposals for a definition of health. No conversation about people. It didn't matter whether we used Facebook, whether we used any other social media, the blogs of the BMJ. There was no conversation. And they say in the Netherlands, we are trying to decide how to allocate the health budget. And thank you very much. You smart us. Has made our life, has made our life more difficult. Now we don't know what to do. <laughs> What should we do? <laughs> okay? What's the response? Okay. So they allocated some money for 30 people to get together with the condition that we would not leave the room where we were going to be locked up until we came up with something useful. You academics was basically the message. Just like grandma had said, you clinicians. These policymakers were saying, you academics, you can do more harm than good thinking that you're so smart. So we found ourselves there, and the British Medical Journal decided to publish uh, the findings of our work, re led by a superwoman, Huber, uh, Magdal Huber. And we said, we cannot define health. So we propose a conceptualization, because we cannot even define a chair. Try to define the chair, or a game, or anything. It's impossible to define things. Because defining things requires to describe the entity in precise terms that everybody would agree reflect the entity. And it's very difficult to find anything that could be defined. Practically impossible, not to say impossible. But you can conceptualize things, you can describe their functionalities, you can describe what they intend to achieve, and people are more comfortable accepting that. But despite that, they put time for a new definition. I guess it sells more. Than, than conceptualization. Sounds too pompous and difficult to grasp, correct? But they meant really conceptualization. And this is what we proposed in 2011. And uh, it was published in advance of the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations, which for the second time was going to focus on a health-related issue. 30 years before, it has been AIDS. Now, so-called non-communicable diseases. See how how we medicalize things. So we need to describe chronic conditions which by definition are incurable on the basis of infections. Huh? 
non-communicable diseases. So we describe them by what they are not. That's okay. That's okay. Words are like children. Some said that Martin Luther had said. I haven't been able to find the actual source. Words are like children. The more attention we pay to them, the more demanding they become. And words should be demanding. Because they are powerful. So this is what we are proposing. To think about health as the ability of an individual or community to adapt and self-manage when we face physical, mental, and social challenges. So before, you were screwed. Glasses, you are unhealthy for the rest of your life. Now, hey, I cannot see. Put your glasses, you are healthy. You are adapting and self-managing. That's, that's the implication of this. We remove the word he- uh, disease from there, and we turn it into an ability rather than a state. Okay? This, is a, this is a fascinating thing. And we fought a lot. Should we put spirituality there? And most of us were tempted to put spirituality there. And we said, no, we're going to take on the WHO if they ever pay attention to us. And we just want to use a language that would resonate with what had been used for more than 60 years. This is part of okay, triggering change. What do you think about this? How many of you have the ability to adapt and self-manage when you face physical, mental, and social challenges? Show me your hands. Okay. 100%. So we are all healthy. How about that? So perhaps, 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 it's just a matter of perspective. And of how we perceive this entity we call health. And by the way, we are toying with the term happiness to and love. Because we want to create a pandemic of health, happiness, and love. I want to be infected by, by that. <laughs> how about you? Okay. So now we believe we have or the opportunity to be healthy. Then, a group of hooligans, we called ourselves constructive hooligans, and Paul is one of them, and I I can see many constructive hooligans here (laughs) that I have come across through my short journey called life. So there's a group of hooligans, and we call ourselves the saluto generators. Salute, health generators. So we are trying to create health. And we are looking at studies that have data coming from opportunities to ask people how they feel. What a concept, to ask people what they feel, not to measure stuff. And for the nursing staff, how often do you measure blood pressure in this hospital? There is no bed, okay? But in the outpatient clinic, does everybody get the blood pressure measure? Everybody? No. No. What proportion? In a hospital with beds? I am told that about 25% of nursing time is used measuring blood pressure and temperature when it doesn't make any sense. So very talented people doing stupid things unnecessarily. (laughs) The patients could do it by themselves. They do it at home. People can do a lot of things by themselves, but we deduct points from their IQ as soon as we detect a disease. So we declare you incompetent. You are a single mother of five. You fought all your life to raise your family. You have a disease. We put you a label. We start talking to you like if, okay, as if you are a stupid child. Okay? That's the kind of things we do. And it's almost automatic. We have been trained to do these kinds of things. So we have been looking at studies with data on quality of life. And if you look at the SS36 and many of these validated tools, the first question is this one. In general, would you say your health is... Excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor. How long did it take me? Seven seconds to say that? How much infrastructure? How many millions of dollars did I need to, to probe the person with this? Nothing. Seven seconds. Okay, and to remember these words. So tell me, how many of you okay, think that in general your health is poor? Fair. For the record, nobody okay, in this room. Good. Very good. Excellent. Not sure? Okay. No, I'm just joking. 100% thank you for that. So 100% of the people in this room think that our health is good, very good or excellent. So you're healthy. We are healthy. So it's not only based on that reconceptualization, but your feelings match that. How many of you have chronic diseases? Raise your hands. Okay. About... 10% 10% of the people here, and yet you're healthy. Wow, how about that? 
Yes, it's possible to be ill or to have a disease and healthy. <sighs> Isn't that liberating? Isn't that liberating? So what if, instead of asking patients when we see them, what seems to be wrong with you? What's your problem? We say, hey, how's your health today? Most of them would say, good, very good, or it's not. There may be a hidden pandemic of health that we haven't been able to detect because we have been looking for disease. And these are data from Canada. There is something called the Survey of Experiences with Primary Health Care. These are data from 2008. And those bars, and these are folks 65 or older, Canadians. And, and the first column uh, is a summary. And these are people with zero chronic diseases, one chronic disease, two or three or more. And this is the, the percentage of people who said that their health is good, very good or excellent. Look, first piece of insight, people with no chronic diseases, 92% of them say that the health is good, very good, or excellent. There is something interesting here. 8% of people don't consider themselves healthy even though they don't have diseases. What's going on there? They may have something acute. We don't know because the question had to do with uh, uh, people uh, who were 65 or older, and I am not sure if they asked or trying to determine if there was something acute there. But there are 8% here that deserve some attention. So not having diseases and, and being healthy is not the same thing either. But then it gets more and more interesting. 86% of people with one chronic disease consider themselves healthy. Then 77% with two chronic conditions. And then 51%, these are old and ill, okay? Three chronic conditions. And 51% say my health is good, very good, or excellent. If this doesn't give you goosebumps, okay, in terms of, of, of rethinking how we do stuff, we need to wonder why. But if we ask people, how are you feeling? And you have the same diagnosis, you have diabetes or arthritis, and the data are very consistent across disease. And they say, my health is good, very good, or excellent. I would say to the physicians, nurses, or any other health professional, please sit on your hands. Okay? Don't shoot. <laughs> don't do it. Don't, don't look at the figure of the blood pressure or the sugar level, or as you would look at it if the person was telling you that the health was poor or fair. Listen, listen to the patient. Okay. And we say, yeah, this is Alex who has become soft. I, we miss Oxford Alex. That's what some of my friends say, the Alex who used to measure everything. We miss Oxford Alex. That's what they tell me. Okay. I developed these huge databases of clinical trials and mathematical formulas to combine them into meta-analysis and a tool to assess the quality. Okay. And my friends say, you're going soft, Alex, like with sadness. <laughs> you're getting soft. Fluffy. So I'm creating a banner that says, to the power of fluff. <laughs> yeah. And then when I find this kind of thing, it, it, it fills my heart with joy. Because it's possible to be ill, healthy, and happy. And these are data uh, from Australia. Cancer survivors, long term. I'm going to go relatively quickly here. The usual quality of life. But these people didn't do what most researchers do with quality of life data. We go for functional data. And we aggregate the data. So we miss the opportunity to know what's happening to people. Okay? Because we think that averages capture people. Okay? And these people. Okay? So here we have percentages of people, uh, quality of life, and self-assessed health status for those of you who may not be able to see it at the back. But again, 93% of people with no cancer or chronic conditions, 93% Australia, not Canada, said that their health was good, very good, or excellent. And then about 90% with cancer and no long-term conditions said that the health was good. Cancer, long-term cancer. 90% of people with cancer said they were healthy. Oh, interesting. Then no cancer and other conditions, it was about 73, 74%, similar to what we found here. And then people with cancer and long-term care conditions, we're talking about 837 people in that category. And there we have over 60%. Wow, okay, so it's not only a Canadian phenomenon, we're not just crazy, we're all folks here, okay, are not just the foggy bunch that don't know what they're telling us. Okay? So these data seem to be, and quality of life, are you delighted and pleased? Look at the data, 48% of people say, what happens with the other 50%? Okay? There is something there that we need to try to understand, but 40% of people with cancer said that they are delighted and pleased. 
and 35% with no cancer and other long-term conditions, and 33% of people with cancer and other conditions. So one-third of people say, I have cancer and I have other conditions, I'm delighted. What could we learn from that? What makes them feel delighted? And how can we make sure that the other 67% feel delighted? And how can we make sure that that 30% stays there and doesn't just fall into the not delighted group? Okay? But then people say, yeah, you went soft, these are data <laughs> descriptive stuff, okay? Okay, this may be more important than we think. So, people with advanced cancer, terminal, incurable cancer, you know you're going to die. Most of us don't think we're going to die. We're still immortal. Friday morning, Valentine's Day here, hmm, there's something wrong with us. Anyway, thank you very much. And for those <laughs> of you who are watching this at a different time and place, full room on Valentine's Day. So we need to talk about love, okay? inevitably. But 181 patients, they did a survey, baseline 96, and followed up in 99. Boom! 63%. Oh. Cancer is the main killer of Canadians. If I get it, I want to be in that group. What makes people belong to that group? Who cares about this thing? Who cares about this thing? What's our role as women's college to try to understand this? What's our role as Toronto? What's our role as Canada? Couldn't this be a wonderful gift to the world? So this is not trivial. When people were compared in terms of how they felt and their survival, it was clear that those who said my health is poor or fair had four times the mortality rate than those during the study period as those who said that their health was good, very good, or excellent. Four times. Whoa. Again, when you started at poor or fair, and then you had a midpoint assessment 18 months later, you had 31 times the chances of dying during those years of the study than those who said that the health was good, very good, or excellent. So this is serious stuff. Okay? And then these clinicians, apparently, because you, we never describe that kind of things in our studies. And I dream with the day when we have a study as beautiful as we put them on the paper, and then on, on a column we say this is what really happened. We were scared. Patients were not joining. The data were, were lost, okay? The database crashed. We had to patch things, and then we show all the beautiful fairy tale <laughs> that the journals like, yeah? But I can sense these people saying, what's going on here? What's going on? Let's look at indicators. And when they put all the clinical indicators that we use to try to predict survival, what patients feel beat our clinical metrics. And I say, yeah, okay? Power to the people. <laughs> huh? We need to listen more. We need to tune in. We need to be prepared to dance with each other. And I'm sure we're going to get to a better place. And by saying, you have cancer, you cannot be healthy. Huh? Let me look at the size of the tumor, if it's spread or not, chemo, radio, surgery. Huh? So instead of what seems to be your problem, my invitation is to start asking, ideally, formally, within Women's College, which is an outpatient institution, define the definition of a hospital or the concept of a hospital, say, how is your health today? And then if your health is poor or fair, we make you a priority, because we want to make sure you are not there, because we know you could be feeling that your health is good, very good or excellent. And then we become health professionals, because now we are disease professionals. We need to pay more attention to symptoms. What bothers people? Symptoms, loneliness, isolation. If not, I have diabetes. I know. How many times are you going to tell me I have diabetes? I've heard it for 20 years. What a surprise. I have diabetes. <laughs> no, my legs are hurting. And then you find a physician who received three to five times less training than a vet to treat pain, which is a situation in Canada. It was a study on pain education of physicians and nurses and dentists and vets. And vets had multiples of the training on pain management and the nurses, the dentists, or the physicians. Okay? So we need to pay attention to symptom control. I cannot eat. Okay? I am anxious. I'm restless. I am weak. Okay? I have pain. I cannot poo. I mean, these are the things that are important to people. And start shifting 
from our diagnose and fix mode, which is very sexy and reinforced by media, we could even take an asshole for it because he's a good diagnostician. <laughs> that's, that's the basic message from, from, from House. He didn't have any manners, and we celebrated that, which is very sad for me, and I hope for you too. So this model is not sufficient. And start removing the notion of disease from our minds. And this was a brilliant paper published in 2004, which I got through Ross Absher. And he said, we can have a health system without diseases because we don't look at people through their labels, <coughs> which don't make any sense. We say, cancer, what's that? There are at least 250 different diseases under that. So saying cancer is like saying infection. You can have Ebola or a common cold, and both are infections. So the term doesn't add much, and it's probably doing more harm than good. So let's imagine a system in which we eliminate disease and ask you, how's your health? And then if you say poor or, or fair, say, tell me why. And we start to look at the reasons why people are not feeling healthy, regardless of the label. And then we start rethinking the labels. And then we can follow the advice of people like Carl May, Victor Montori, and Francis Mayer, who said we need to do less. Less can be more. Okay? Resist the urge to do. And then we can start shifting from trying to put more years into our lives to put more life into our years, which is what I want. My life expectancy has doubled already, but I am dreading my old age. And some people say that Dr. Seuss composed this. I doubt it, but what the heck? It's called the golden years. Have you seen it? We should have this in every consulting room. We should have this on, on, the, on the ceiling of our bedrooms. When we wake up in the morning, we need to see. This is what patients need. And I will try to be a Colombian Dr. Seuss. <laughs> I cannot see. I cannot pee. I cannot chew. I cannot screw. My memory shrinks. My hearing stinks. No sense of smell. I look like hell. My body is drooping. I have trouble pooping. The golden years have come at last. The golden years can kick me out. <laughs> this is anonymous. This is anonymous, but I think it represents very clearly what patients are crying at us to do. Pay attention to what is reducing my quality of life. It don't, don't dehumanize me more. Don't medicalize my life, for God's sake. Listen to me. Respect me. Play with me. Dance with me. Contribute to my life. So some people, again, in the Netherlands are paying attention to this. And there is something called dementia bill. It's really Hodgeway, or some, whatever it is, in whatever way it's pronounced in, in Dutch. But these people are demented. <laughs> and they can go to the bar and have a drink. They can go to the hairdressers. They can go to the shop and get stuff. It doesn't matter what they put there, if they pay or not, and how much they pay. Because everybody working in that town is a health profession. So the taxi driver is a physician. The hairdresser is a nurse. The clerk is a social worker. We have an occupational therapist as the bartender. <sighs> and these people who in, in normal circumstances would be tied, drugged, kept in a dumping ground. I know how we call them, long-term care facilities, that kind of stuff. But they are dumping grounds. We don't want you. You are not useful anymore. Go there. Okay? We don't want to even see you. These people are experiencing a full life almost until their last breath. And these are health professionals. So it's possible. It's a matter of attitude and perspective. And willingness to let go a bit and to unlearn a bit. So, but this is health and happiness and hopefully love until almost the last breath. Because there are some very interesting and consistent statistics that keep popping up very consistently around the world. Um, the human mortality rate continues to be 100%. Don't believe the studies that say this intervention reduced mortality by 30%. It didn't, it didn't. It reduced mortality during the duration of the study from that condition. But if you follow people long enough, uh, the mortality rate seems to be very consistent. Okay? And it doesn't matter how rich we are, it doesn't matter where we are, how good the weather, or how about the politics, or whatever, we are all going to die. And sooner than we think. Because my grandfather used to say, life is like a roll of, to of toilet paper. Each unit is the same, each square, same, same size. But the more you have taken from it, the faster it goes. <laughs> 
So we need to be very careful with how we use our time. And we need to start asking ourselves in first person, in this case plural, how we would like to end our life? How would I like to die? Where I would like to die? Okay? And not to be scared about this. Philosophers keep telling us over and over again that death gives meaning to our lives. That the more we recognize it, the more able we are to savor everything. Now I'm absolutely conscious of my mortality. You cannot imagine the time I'm having. <laughs> I'm completely happy. I can drop dead here and you would tell my board of directors, he went happy. <laughs> hmm? It is possible. But why? I'm thinking about it. Because to die well, I need to live well. Because I don't know when I'm going to die. And we have very little data as to how we die. We have so-so data about who dies, when and where, but not how. And by the way, this is the mother of Daphne Todd, and she agreed to be painted by her daughter. And her body was kept in the, in the room until her daughter said, I'm done. And that was the deal. And everybody knew and allowed her to do that. And this is how she died. How many of you would like to look like that when you die? Okay, how many of you would like to die as our patients die now? Show me hands. Not a single one. Okay? My question is why? And what are we waiting for to do something different? If we don't want to die like our patients are dying, then what's happening here? Okay? Pretty serious stuff. Oh, I don't want to die like my patients die. Okay? Then how would you like to die? And how can we make sure everybody can die as you want to die, or as you want your mother to die, or your children to die? And let's make that a priority. Instead of fooling ourselves, measuring this silly thing and that silly thing and getting awards and writing papers that nobody reads and getting grants to offset the, the sorry state of the finances of most of our institutions or giving awards to each other. Bravo, bravo, bravo. About what? We're not facing the big ones. Okay? This is substandard. So I found myself humbled even more and more through my journey as a patient. In this case, I couldn't get two gowns. You, have, you can only have one, and I had to decide. Do, do I expose myself as a flasher and do nothing as a protest? I really thought about that. I'm going to leave it open and see what they do. <laughs> I really thought about it. I was so upset that they said, what would happen if I did it? Or let my ass exposed, okay? And, and, and then I, I, I conceded somehow. But then I was there, I said, okay. This is what my, my question came. Is it possible to live a healthy and happy life until our last breath? And now I have had it full of love and with no regret. That's what I want for me. That's what I want for my wife, for my kids, for my friends, for you, for everybody I come across. So for that, we need to prevent the preventable. We need to treat the treatable. And we need to start learning more and more how to cope with inevitable, how to transcend it even better. There's something inevitable. Can, how can we turn that into the most meaningful thing that has happened to you? Because you're going to live with that for the rest of your days. Imagine being grateful for a diagnosis of okay, sclerosis multiple. That would be crazy. Okay, but we're going to die of something. Canada cancer number one, heart disease number two. And no matter what we do, we're going to die. So how can we start now healing ourselves? It doesn't look good. And feel free to interrupt me at any time. Okay? But 73% of residents, 66% of junior nurses are burnt out. Suicide is the second cause of death amongst medical students after accidents. There is no gender equity. Female physicians kill themselves more often than male physicians and much more often than female members of the public who are not physicians. Healthcare workers have more sick days than the average Canadian population. So I call this the need for the oxygen mask. And my board used to say, look after yourself, look after yourself. You are the first to respond to your students. You are the first to respond to the patients. You are the first to respond to us. You need to look after yourself. No, that's selfishness. No, that's not selfishness. That's common sense. I couldn't say it. One day I was on a plane, and the usual, in the event of an unlikely event of a decompression, cameras will fall, masks will fall, grab yours, put it. But the key thing was, Put your own mask first. 
even if you're assisting somebody else. Even if you have your baby with you, put your own mask on. Martha, I know, my kids, what they were telling me, I have to put my mask on first. And I wonder if we're putting our mask on first to be able you see, to support others. So we are becoming a sick bunch. So I'm going to give you a quick tour, and you can interrupt me at any time, about what do we do about these things. Now we have a concept that allows us to be all healthy. How can we spread it in a world which is controlled and, and, and managed and overpowered by disease? We are looking at the world through a disease lens. How could we switch our lenses for a health one? Hmm? That would help us, at least within small groups like this, to start looking at each other differently. But we don't have a pandemic yet. So I started this project called the Maimonides Project, and one of its objectives is to create a pandemic of health and wellness together, and happiness and love. But for these audiences up on the camera, I wasn't sure. And it's inspired by Maimonides, a philosopher who 800 years ago in Andalusia, Spain, said, teach your tongue to say, I don't know, and you will progress. We don't have a clue as to how to make this happen. But just by saying, I don't have a clue, we become safer. And we start trying to make decisions in a more careful way. And we are trying to combine three things and to create ecosystems for massive, massive change around the world. So we turn regions, hospitals, neighborhoods, entire countries into living labs, like a petri dish, like a sandbox, where we can play together with the public, with the private sector, with the government, with academics. We are all accomplices who trust each other within each of these containers to try to answer the tough questions. And then we create scenarios of the future. Let's imagine a better future, and let's create that future within those environments. And then let's bring hooligans from around the world to, 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 to produce radical change. And we call it radical global innovation. Global is global and local, because nobody has the critical mass to do anything meaningful alone. But together, we might have a good shot. <coughs> That's what brought me to Toronto. I was at McMaster quite happy, and I was in, in England pretty happy. But then when I came here, I said, that place hasn't been an empire. People don't hate Canadians, by and large. We are becoming <laughs> not that nice anymore. Okay? Our reputation and our brand is suffering a lot because we are getting nasty. Hmm? But people still smile. I'm Colombian, so half of the world smile at me. And as a Canadian, the other half smiles at me. Okay? So I can go around and say, hey, let's join forces. But we have the world around us, in our neighborhood. 200 different ethnocultural communities together. Imagine transforming downtown Toronto into a sandbox where we can imagine the future and create it, a future where health, love, and happiness are pandemic. That's what we can do. Hmm? We created the Center for Global Health Innovation just a couple of blocks away from here at the Toronto General Hospital site. We have a simulator of the future. We can imagine, and we have like a movie set where we can build the future together. And we can connect 400 different locations around the world to participate in this kind of efforts with us. Okay. And then people in Spain said, bring it on. So we took the Basque country in Spain, 2.2 million people, and we showed how we could bring the best available knowledge from around the world, and we created this platform in Andalusia in the south. I was coordinating it from here. And we gathered all the knowledge on how to deal with multiple chronic diseases in the world and innovations from around the world, put them in one place and offer them to our friends in the Basque country. And in 18 months, we could stratify for risk 2.2 million people. And then the government issued policies that allowed us to do things without barriers and put hundreds of millions of, of euros from their budget in 14 projects. And the results were staggering to the point that the Minister of Health has been called to the White House to help the Americans from the Basque country on how to do it, because in two and a half years, they transformed the entire system. Okay? And I'm proud to have had the opportunity to witness this and to facilitate it somehow. But we transformed the place into a generator of possibilities for a better future, join forces across boundaries, corporate sector, public sector, the academics and the public, and massive change happened. I'm loving it now, Colombia. Okay? seems to be one of the boldest places in the world. In fact, two years in a row, the happiest country in the world. Gallup asks the same question to people. It's not, do you have infrastructure? Do you have safety? Do you have a house? Do you have a high income? That kind of indicators would never show a country like this as happy. But if you ask people, 
How are you feeling? How happy are you? Colombia comes first. <laughs> Canada in 2012, 18th. Okay? So there is something happening there. Medellin, last year, the happiest city in the world and the most innovative, beat New York City and Tel Aviv. This was the murder capital of the world 25 years ago. <laughs> leadership, leadership transformed. And these people want to do things. <coughs> Colombia is the world's fastest growing smartphone market. People adopting these things, creating opportunities for us to spread like viruses. So what happens when you have the happiest and the most innovative? You can do crazy things. I'm going to show you very quickly, and I will be finishing in two minutes. So we created an army of people from the community going home by home by home, asking people, how are you feeling? And checking some of our indicators and social determinants of health, too. From the community, one person looking after 300 to 3,000 families stratified the population, screened for risk factors, vaccination, triage, community education. We asked questions using tablets for data collection there and transformed the paper into electronic, facilitated access to primary care centers within 800 meters. Then, okay, we had emergency room within 2.5 kilometers, secondary hospitals five kilometers away, and a tertiary center within 25 minutes by car. Okay? And now we have over 600,000 people contributing data, learning with each other, trying to figure out how a place like this could be happy and healthy, and full of love, even when there are diseases. And we're looking at social determinants of health with indicators of disease, happiness, health, and love. And we are trying to combine quantitative and qualitative tools, and they want to collaborate with us if we ever care to bother. Okay. And they put $250 million now into 50 blocks, and this is the innovation district of Medellin, and the idea is to have the community where people have the highest number of needs met in the world. And this is integral, comprehensive human development. Medellin, Colombia. So what would we ask a genie if we found Aladdin Slam? When we have so many opportunities here. When we are so rich. So rich. My hospital has a budget which is bigger than the GDP of at least 15 different countries in the world. And we don't have enough. Yeah? Could we create the focus? Because we have the world around us. We could learn about what are those determinants of health, true determinants of health, not determinants of disease, which is what we are looking at. And make sure that the lessons we learn here, we can disseminate throughout the world, because we have the world here. We have to serve the world here. So it's just by doing our work here, we'll be able to transform the planet. But we need to believe it. Thank you very much. Alex, um, just an amazing talk, and I think so many important messages that really resonate with us here at Women's. Now, do we have time for just one or two questions? Somebody, that somebody wants to come through? Yes. Um, so right now, the patient experience seems to be the area that we're looking towards trying to connect patients to healthcare providers to have that dialogue. Are we on the right track? No, because we really don't care about the patient experience. If we really cared about the patient experience, we would be asking them. How would you like the experience to be? And the, the experience for a patient is not to be a patient to begin with. Yeah? So if you ask me, I don't want to be a patient. I want to be impatient. Yeah? To begin with, I dislike the term. I don't want to be patient. I want you to respond to my needs and to tell me that you cannot, then I can do something about my life. Okay? So don't, so, so, and then when we talk about the experience, we tend to look at tools that have been developed largely by people like me who don't have a clue about what it is to be a patient and who look at the experience from our perspective. So I think we need to become more phenomenological. And I really encourage people to read the work of Javi Carelli. Javi Carelli, she's a philosopher from the UK. And, and, and she has taught me more about the patient experience that I have learned in any journal, in any exercise in which I have participated. And I have claimed that I've spent the last 25 years of my life trying to improve the patient experience until I picked her book. It's entitled Illness. I really encourage you to see it. Okay? because it gives us an inside view of what it is to live as a patient. Then we need to immerse ourselves into the, the, the experience to come. So we, we need to have people who are 
running the patient experience program who are patients, who have been hurt by the system, who are dissatisfied, not people who are just walking around making a living out of it. So that's my concern. I hope I'm dealing with it. But we, and patient-centeredness, we have devalued that term, just like we devalued evidence-based, or as we devalued shared decision-making and all those terms. We are very good at hijacking these things that appear beautiful and then turn them into more of the same, just to show it in the annual reports. Alex, Alex well done, well said. <laughs> Alex, uh, you're the chair of Global eHealth Innovation here. And I'm wondering, so with this vision you have of, you know, health, everyone feels healthy if they want to, sort of, what do you think? No, 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 hold it, hold it. Okay, this is our usual attitude. They're healthy if they want it, sort of. Who would not like to be healthy first? Aha, okay? So then the risk here is the risk of self-management. And I'm going to let you, I'm just using you as a device, rhetorical <laughs> device. <laughs> no, nothing personal, nothing personal, okay? Really, I don't know you and you called me Alex, so I love you. Man. <laughs> so, but, but this is usually the automatic response, okay? We don't even recognize what we say. It's like self-management, big risk. If you cannot manage, it's your fault. It's like self-help. You buy a self-help book, you're not help. What did I do wrong? It's my fault. So everybody wants to be healthy. I would like to say, I know you didn't mean to say that. So please re rephrase well, your I, question. I guess my specific question is... No, no, rephrase it. So it sounds nicer. <laughs> not, no, I guess people want to be healthy. Sort of. Let's say, who doesn't want to be healthy? So go, go, go for it. Go for it. Rephrase it. Everyone wants to be healthy. Yes. <laughs> okay. So what, so what do you feel, how do you feel technology plays a role in that? As, as little as possible, as little as possible, because we are in a society which is increasingly dehumanized, and technology has promised us paradise from the beginning of the industrial age. We were meant to have two-hour work days, okay, because these machines could do better things, faster, they were stronger, and all that stuff. And what we have become is part of an industrial process driven by technology. Okay? So most of us are nondescript people, entities for the patients. They don't know who you are. They don't know who I am. You don't care who they are. I don't care who they are. We don't. We, I just, I'm, I'm in my cubicle or in my office getting people and technology contributed to that. So now we have these information and communications technologies and we all have hopes for them. Yeah? When most of the problems we are facing are really economic and political. And there was a colleague in the US who said, you can never, never, you can never tackle a social problem with technology. He said 99%, I'm just going for 100%. So we think that technology can solve things? Nah. We need to get our politics right. We need to get our economic models right. We need to read more Max Neef, a Chilean economist who developed a model at human scale. We need to have the economy work for people, not people who work for the economy. When we have a world in which 85 people have more money than 3.5 billion, we are screwed, man. We, you can put all the technology you want there. Yeah? We need to fix the politics. And, and make politics work for people. That's what police mean. Yeah? Not for the politicians, for the corporate sector. Yeah? And we need economic models that contribute to our happiness, our health, and to love each other more. Not to become machines scared about the inability to pay mortgages and all these debts that we incurred because the credit cards are so easy to get. And everybody's desperate to grow, 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 grow without thinking about why. So no, technology, I hope, uh, I hope we, I am the Canada researcher in e-health innovation. I dream with the day when I can delete the e. <laughs> the Canada researcher of health innovation. And then eliminate the need for me or for people like us. Then we are successful. We are successful when we are not needed. So I think with that, I mean, I think what an, what an amazing talk. I think we're totally inspired. And how perfect. I mean, today's Valentine's Day, but we're here at Women's, and what an opportunity we have with the work that we're doing, reaching out to the community, a hospital really designed to keep people healthy and keep them in the community. So, Alex, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here.